Before I get started, let me uh, welcome all of you guys here, our EIU students, EIU faculty, staff. Uh, my name is Dr. Marco Brunhagen. I'm the Lumpkin Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and also the director of our new Entrepreneurship Center here at EIU. The Entrepreneurship Center, as you may know, is named the SEED Center, which stands for Sustainable Entrepreneurship through Education and Development. In short, we're trying to plant the seed to grow entrepreneurship in this area. Tonight's event is held during Entrepreneurship Week, a week of celebration of the entrepreneurial spirit at EIU, which we have held for six years now, and we're very proud to host two Hallmark events this week. These events allow us to showcase the expertise and the contributions that the study of entrepreneurial ventures contributes to the local, the regional, and even the global economy. This is the sixth year that we're also operating our minor in entrepreneurship, which is a campus-wide minor housed in the School of Business. Over 70 students across the EIU campus have already chosen to declare entrepreneurship as their minor and I know that many of them are here with us tonight. As part of this, week's, of this year's Entrepreneurship Week, on Thursday, there will be a panel of five experts offering different expert perspectives on the ins and outs of franchising. The panelists include the Vice President of Franchise Operations of Midas International and the Assistant Attorney General of the State of Illinois. The panel will be held in this room on Thursday at 5 p.m., so same time, same place, but you guys are all more than welcome to come. Tonight's event features Mr. Bob Kehoe. That's the guy over here on the left. He is the CEO of Leverage Marketing, an online marketing company. He's also an alum of EIU School of Business, and he also played football here at EIU. Go Panthers. <laughs> he will discuss his journey, developing his company, and how he was able to become successful as an entrepreneur. Our speaker tonight has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of his talk, and we will pass microphones around to facilitate, facilitate questions from the audience. So once we're ready to take questions, look out for the microphones. Also, a quick reminder, if you have not swiped your Panther cards when you came inside, inside the auditorium, please do so as you leave. So we record who has actually been here. Okay. So with that, very proud tonight to introduce to you Mr. Bob Kehoe. Let's give him all a warm welcome. Slide. Appreciate that. All right, good question. Anybody know the answer to this? Why join the Navy when you can be a pirate? Who said it? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs said it. Turned out to be a hell of a pirate, didn't he? Um, you know, Steve Jobs was, is, is so I, I'll say that right now that um, I'm no Steve Jobs, but I'm a hell of a pirate too. Um, we're gonna take a look right now, when I go through this, I'm gonna show you really just where I went from Charleston, Illinois, all the way to where I am now. I figured I'd just show you the journey that I went through um, to get to where I am today, but I really, um, never really had a job before in my life. Um, I've had one in my adult career, and so we're going to take a look at some of that. So here's me back in 1993. I actually had a class in this uh, in this room. I sat back there in the very last row. Um, it's kind of weird being back here and seeing it, but I met my wife here in uh, 1990, um, as I like to introduce her as my current wife. Um, so I, I met her back, and there's me with my jar head and um, standing on the field back when it was grass. So uh, it's really cool being back in Eastern. I got to be honest, that's the first time I've been back in 23 years. I haven't been back to Charleston. Um, it looks the same. A little bit, little bit different, but it hasn't really changed very much. So I want to discuss today just my life as a pirate. Um, you know, I've been been through a lot as an entrepreneur. But one thing I tell you about an entrepreneur is if you think you want to be an entrepreneur, you probably shouldn't be. You got to know you want to be an entrepreneur. It's hard. Um, I've been tossed around by violent economic cycles. Uh, I've been uh, rapidly changing technologies. I've ridden businesses up to the top, down to the very bottom, and then back up to the top again. So as I go through this, uh, I want to show you guys, maybe take a look and listen to what I'm saying. Try to identify some of the traits that you're going to need to be an entrepreneur. I can tell you right now, you can figure out if you have it or not. If you have it, that's great. 
Um, but if you don't have the stomach for it, it it's, it's not a great place to be. I've seen a lot of businesses fail. Guys who thought they should be entrepreneurs and just failed because they didn't have, have, have the right temperament for it. They didn't have the right tolerance for the biggest thing you're going to experience as an entrepreneur. The number one thing you're going to experience as an entrepreneur is risk. And you got to love risk. Right? Um, be like you're a golfer and you're standing over a putt that's worth a lot of money, being able to sink that putt without being nervous. And it's, it's one of those things where you're either born with it, I think. It's really hard to develop into an entrepreneur. Um, you kind of are going to see those traits. What I do isn't for everybody. I can guarantee that. Um, so company number one, um, is, I call it being a necessity entrepreneur. Um, you know, I got out of college and I floated. I was, I was just lost. When I went back up to Chicago, I'm from the northwest side of Chicago, I got back up there and um, I graduated here with the Green Business and I also was a teaching certificate. And so I went up to back to Chicago and I had no interest in going to work for some uh, blue chip company. Um, you know, everyone there, all my family and friends, said, oh, you got a degree, you got a degree now. You're gonna go work for a business and do businessy things. And I didn't even know what that meant, to tell you the truth. I really had no interest in doing that. So what I did do is I figured out though that, you know, to, to turn a job, turn a business from something that I did during college. So I needed to make money. I was 23 years old. I had zero interest in the corporate path. Um, I turned a college job into a business. We invented a new way to set steel I-beams in houses. More on that in a second. Uh, it was dangerous and insane work. Um, nobody had ever done it before like we did it. And we were, we were looking for excitement and we enjoyed the risk. And the guys that I partnered with, they all enjoyed the risk as well. And not only the physical risk, but the financial risk as well because we, we put some money on it. Basically all the money we had, we put into it. So just real quick, I'll tell you what it was. These are steel I-beams that go across a basement. So if you have a house and it, with, a, with a basement in it, there's steel I-beams that run through the middle of it, right? And so what we figured out is that when we were in college, what we did was um, summers and breaks, we would meet a crane and then set the crane up and jump down in a hole and we set these big six, 800 pound beams up, right? And so we'd meet a crane company out there to do it. What me and my buddies figured out was we could actually do that by hand by using a series of leverage and muscle to get those in place without using a crane. Because the thing took the longest was actually setting up the crane. So what we did was we went out and we went and started doing this. And how we tested it was when we went out at night and found houses that had the steel drop next to it and we practiced. We took a few trial runs. I'm sure the carpenter showed up the next day and wondered why the steel was set. But we tried to go ahead and, and we, we figured out how to drop it down to our shoulders, bring it up to a ladder and up to a column and then brace it off. And those things are huge, but with leverage you can do it, okay? So what we did was we went over to the steel companies and said, hey steel company, we can set those steel i beams for half the price, and we can do three or four times more houses than a crane can do. They thought we were crazy, which we really were pretty crazy for doing this. And they said, well, the way we got them to do it, we said, well, we're going to this next steel company down the road, either you sign up for it here, or we're gonna go to the next guy and we're not coming back to you. So we got one guy to go ahead and agree to give us a whole weeks worth of work and we got it done in two days. So when I was doing this job, we were making about $3,000 a week each doing it. By the time we were rolling, we were making $3,000 a day. And it was a ton of money at the time. We're making three grand a day um, and it was a ton, of, it was a lot of fun, but it was dangerous, it was hard work. I started out, I was six foot three. By the time I was done, I was probably about six foot one from being smashed down by steel. But it was, it, it was, um, it was dangerous, insane work. It wasn't, I knew I wasn't gonna do it forever, and that time did come. By the time I was done with it, um, so, you know, this is where I go with the pirate's life again, it meant moving on from this, and moving on from something where you're making a lot of money doing, that's a hard thing to do. But I knew that's not what I wanted to do in construction, physically demanding. Our version of it was extreme. Um, the housing boom, boom started wobbling a little bit. And then we looked at, it, you know, if you stay too, too long into something, it's called the golden handcuffs, right? Golden handcuffs means you're stuck because your bills start to raise, you start to buy a house, start to have kids, all these things happen, you gotta start making a certain amount of money. Problem with that is, is you can't all of a sudden just go backward and make no money when you got all these bills. So I knew that that time was coming. And again, this is 94, 95, what was happening at that time? The web was just starting to come around, right? The internet was here. Um, you know, now we take it for granted, obviously, but back then, it was cool. And I was just jacked about it. I, I was into it. Um, I'll tell you a little more about that. What I was doing while I was doing this, that night, I was going to Northwestern's University College. I was taking programming classes. 
Um, so I would show up at Northwestern University College in a, in a programming class, learning C, C++, Visual Basic, Information Systems. And I'm going there, and I, you know, I show up in my Carhartts and my boots, you know, looking sunburned in December. And I'm in there with a bunch of kids that look like extras from The Walking Dead because they ain't been outside in, you know, months. And so I didn't, I didn't really care about that though, but I was there learning it. I knew I had an interest in computers, I had an interest in technology. I had my first computer in 1981, it was a TRS-80. And here, when I was here, I had a 386 when I was here. That's kind of funny now, but it was, and actually it was just out in uh, Palo Alto, out in uh, out of Google, and went to the computer museum, and the computers that uh, we used when we were in school are in the museum. Um, but it was pretty cool at the time. So, that's a lot of my new course. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, the next couple slides are an example of why my marketing department doesn't allow me to do PowerPoint. I break every rule in PowerPoint, and they're horrible. But um, started plotting a new course, and so, but that's when I, what I was taking a look at is I knew that I needed to get out of construction and I had a teaching certificate. Um, so what I decided to do was I decided to go back to teach high school, which was pretty, pretty, pretty insane. So I went, and ta I went and I sold the trucks. We had, at the time when I left, we had three trucks going out every day, six days a week, 10 hours a day, set and steel. The amount of money we were making was, was ridiculous. It took me a lot of years after that to even get back to that same level of income. But being 23, 24 years old, Living in Chicago, um, I spent it all. Every last penny of it, I spent it all. And, and then some, probably owed some people some money to it by the time I was done. But we were young kids, just making too much money at the time, you know. So, um, plotting a new course. So I go into, uh, so I go in and I find out from a buddy of mine, a guy that uh, Jenny and I played football in college, a fellow named Tosh Wagers, working at a place called Ward Tech High School. And he tells me about a, an opening at the school. And it was basically developed a computer curriculum for the business department at Gordon Tech High School. I said, this sounds great. It's almost like being an entrepreneur. It's kind of cool. I could be my own boss. Nobody's ever done it before. This sounds pretty neat. So I signed on as a teacher. I was excited about signing on as a teacher until I saw the contract. The contract was $23,000 a year to teach high school. And so I wound up teaching summer school, night school, uh, coached two sports, and I wound up making $36,000 that year coming from making well over six figures as a construction guy. But I knew that the construction thing wasn't gonna last. So again, this is where I started company number two. Company number two, I called it the computer tutor. So I'm teaching, I'm coaching, um, doing all these different things. And my wife and I had our first, um, our first child in 97. And so I needed money. I needed money quick. And so out of necessity, I started this, and I call it entrepreneurship with a safety net. Basically what that is, I had a job that I was being paid to do, but I started a company, and basically what I did was I went around and trained people how to use their computers and fix their computers. I did everything related to a computer I could get my hands on, and it was really um, all done through referrals. And so I still had a steady check, I capitalized on the growing interest in the internet. In any business you want to start, you have to find a need, right? There's a need, you got to fill it. Fill it a different way, do something different, do it differently than somebody else did it, and make some money doing it. Um, and the business grew through referrals, like I said, and I had a steady supply of cheap labor. And the steady supply of cheap labor was kind of born out of necessity, which was, um, oh, this is, the, this is the actual business card. I found it. And um, check out that web address. HTTP colon slash slash home dot earthlink dot net forward slash tilde v kehoe. How about that for a memorable address, right? Um, Bob Keo, here's my here's what I did. I, I was trained on most popular applications, Windows 95, the internet, <laughs> Office 97 in previous versions, troubleshooting, software installation. That was my business card, man, and it was cool. Uh, back then, that was cutting edge stuff. I was basically Geek Squad before Geek Squad was around. I mean, that, that, that was, it was Geek Squad before, right? That's their business model, that's what they do. Anyway, so there I am, the computer tutor, and so, I was training, I was coach, I was teaching, doing all this stuff, man. I'm working my butt off, I'm going around sharing. You, you, know, you guys think showing your mom about Instagram or Facebook, Pinterest, any of those is hard? Try, try showing some middle-aged business guy back in 95 about Excel when he's coming from a typewriter and doing ledgers by hand. That was brutal. Anyway, so I started finding out that a lot of computers are broken, right? Because there's nobody that knew. Back then, installing software was hard. You didn't just go ahead and click a button and the app installed. It was, you know, you had to know some commands and DOS, and you had to do some stuff about a computer, right? I love that, I love that my compatriots are all shaking me. Yep, yep, yep. Um, but you had to, so you had to know some stuff. Anyway, the, the computers break, and so I'm getting this business coming to me where it's, I don't have enough time. 
and I'm taking it on because I'll never stop sales. That's another rule in entrepreneurship is you never stop sales. Always continue to make money because you don't know it's gonna go away. Figure out somebody that can do the work for you. And I did. I had four students that were brilliant. These kids were so far ahead of the other kids at school that I couldn't teach to them. They're in my general computer classes. They're just and so what did I do? I said, I got this cheap labor right here. who are gonna learn from computers, right? They're gonna learn from the systems I bring in. So I'm, I had this great operation going. I'm bringing all these computers in, the kids in class are fixing them, right? Did this for about six months, and I learned a very, very, very important thing about myself at that moment when the principal came in and shut my operation down. I learned that I am 100% unemployable. I could not have a job, I could never work for somebody because it was an arbitrary rule that he thought was something that needed to be enforced. And I, I, in my mind, I'm like, no, these kids are working on systems now that they could never, and I'm poor, a teacher at your school, and these kids are working on systems that, that there's no way that they'll ever see again, right? And so, and I, proved, I was proven to be right, by the way, because four of those kids wound up going in the IT field. One of them owns a big, a large IT consulting firm in downtown Chicago. So that's proven, right? And so those four, those four guys, the principal shuts my operation down. Summer's coming up that year. Let's see. Uh, oh, I'm like, oh yeah, let me go back. All right, so summer's coming up that Summer's coming up, and I, I, make a, I take a risk. And the risk was, the risk is always gonna be guaranteed money versus money that you may make because you're good at what you do, right? I took the bet and I said, you know what? I'm gonna live on the computer tutor money for this summer. I'm gonna see if I can make this thing go. And so I started doubling down on going out and marketing and help put my product out there. I soon started making more money doing that than I was teaching. And so I was making more money doing the computer than I was teaching. And then what happened was this. One more. All right, this is it, man, this is the big break. And so what happened is, I'm driving down, I used to have this habit of going to all the hot dog stands in the neighborhood, I put my flyers out there, somebody get my flyer, and maybe call me, maybe not. I'll never forget it to this day, I'm driving back home from somewhere, and all I want to do is get home, and I passed this place called uh, Harpo's at the time, now it's called the Dog House, that's the actual place. And I'm driving by it, and I get probably a mile down, and I'm like, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna go back and put some flyers in there. Did a U-turn, came back around, and I dropped off my flyers computer tutor at the hot dog stand. All of a sudden, a few weeks later, I get a call from a fellow named Gabe Caparel. That's him on the right. He uses that picture on his website still. He's probably about 20 old years older than that though. Um, that's Gabe. And Gabe Caparel calls me up and he has this Italian accent. And he says, they won't try to do an Italian accent. But he says, hey, you know anything about this web crap? I'm like, yeah, I know some stuff about it. What do you need? He goes, come in and work with my agents. And then I got a lot of computers that need to be fixed. And I need all this help. And he became my first regular customer. And I'm gonna forget it, I felt, man, I tell you, I was addicted from that moment on. I was hooked on bringing new customers that would pay me continuous revenue to do some work. I wasn't addicted to the work part. I didn't like that, but I loved the selling part. I loved doing the deal. I loved making stuff happen. And I knew that moment there, I had something. I was digging it. I was there, and I'm in his office. I'm just doing, I'm working with his agents. And then I get this great idea, and this is 97, I get this idea, hey man, you need a website. And you're like, whoa, what do I need a website for? So you, people can see your listings. Now, this is eight years before Zillow, eight, ten years actually, nine, eight, nine years before Zillow, everybody knows Zillow, right? This is before it was even an idea. I mean, this is early on, I'm, and I said, hey listen, let's put your listings online. I'll build you a website. So I start making him a website, he agrees, he funds it, he gives me some money to do it, I start building it. You know, doing it myself. I'm building an HTML. Uh, I got a SQL database going for the listings. Um, you know, and I, my idea was to have the admins at the company enter the listings in, publish them to the web on his website, and hopefully consumers would come look just like they do now. But this is '97 when it was unheard of to do. And so I started building this website for him. I think, oh man, I'm I'm a genius. This is great. I'm gonna make a million dollars building websites for real estate brokerages, and I'm gonna have them put their listings online. So. Another flyer changed the course of my direction. My direction. All of a sudden, I get this flyer. I, I found out later that Gabe had a habit of picking up flyers, um, and he would buy a lot of stuff. But so Gabe, Gabe hands me this flyer, and it's from this company called Birdview Internet Properties. Ooh, these guys sound cool. Birdview Internet Properties. All right, what do they? Do? So I look at the flyer, and it says they could do everything I could do plus more. They had it figured out where they would, they wrote software that automatically accessed the multiple listing service. That's where all real estate brokers put their listings. Automatically accessed MLS, sucked the listings out, 
put them on a web page, right? And this is unheard of at the time. And I get fired, I'm like, ooh, I can't do that. I'm in trouble. My business is sunk. So I could have done one of two things at that moment. One, Gabe, I had Gabe's trust, right? He said, Gabe, this is a stupid thing ever. You don't want to do that. You want to do it with me, keep paying me money. Or two, I could have said, I'm going to call these guys and see what they're up to. And when I called those guys, it was one guy, right? And he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. More on him in a second. Anyway, so I call him, Gabe signs up, and then um, I wind up meeting. This is the slide that gets me. This is the one. This is the one that my marketing department would go, ah, God, stop. Anyway, birdview.com. Uh, I met a guy named Bedros Pedrosian. There's me. See, I, I need a good tea there, don't I? Come on. Look at that, man. If there's a face that needs a good tea, that's that one. It, it's, it's the, it's the it's extra chin needs to be covered. Anyway, it's funny. I had a hairline and everything. I think it's one of 10 times in my life I've worn a tie. Um, so this is me, the computer tutor. Here's Bedros Pedrosian. Bedros Pedrosian ended up being my partner for the next 17 years. He's still my partner today. Um, I've called him over and I just, you know, and this goes into the bucket of partner with good people, partner with the right people, people that complement your skills. Don't have a partner if you don't have to, but if you have a partner, have one that's going to complement your skills. He's one of the best people I've ever met. He's a brilliant visionary and he had, he complimented me because he could build and do and I could sell. And that's what I realized is that I was good at selling. I wasn't great at, I wasn't, you know, if you put me in a room with another coder, it was terrible coding compared to them. But I, I muddled through a little bit. It's like somebody who barely speaks Spanish and tries to speak Spanish. I was that guy, but coding. Bedros, brilliant, brilliant program. He had a, he has a uh, double lead from Northwestern University. Um, just a smart, smart guy. Anyway, so I meet Bedros, and I said to Bedros, June 24th, 1998, remember like it was yesterday. Uh, I said, listen, why doesn't the computer tutor become your sales arm, right? I'll be your sales arm and you go ahead and rebuild it. So I get two months, right? I got two months to go. I almost forgot that I had to go back to school to teach. Um, I was in a contract. And so I start selling, I start, he goes, yeah, that's great, let's do it. I go out and he had at the time, he had three customers. By the time those two months were over, he had 15 customers and I sold them all. And we knew we, at that moment, we knew we had something. We knew, we, we, we knew. We knew we had something good going on, and it was an exciting time. We were passionate about the web. We were passionate about the internet. And that's something to really understand is if you're going to be an entrepreneur, whatever you're selling, whatever you're doing, you have to have passion because there's going to be times where you're going to continue, you're going to get kicked, and the passion is the only thing that's going to keep you going. It's the excitement, the knowing you're right. Entrepreneurs know they're right. Okay, entrepreneurs know they're right, and nobody can tell them they're wrong. Now that's also a detriment sometimes. But when I'm right, I know it, you're not going to knock me off that position. And that's exactly what Bedros and I were like with the web. And what was Bedros Bedrosian, I've never been able to say his name one time. Because everyone's like, what? what? Bedros? Anyway, so there's Bedros. And what came out of this here, oh, and I decided not to go back to teach. And it cost me 10% of my contract to not go back. So I had to pay them 10% of it to get out of the contract. It was $2,300. The only time I was glad I didn't make that much money. Um, so we wrote a check, and uh, I never forget the vice principal that I gave the check to his words. What are you going to do when this internet bad thing is over? <laughs> he laughed at him because he didn't know. Birdview.com, and that was the actual logo from back then. And that is a logo in 1998. That was the logo. It's kind of silly looking now, you know, but back then that was, uh, it was cutting edge. So we had a unique concept. Give us your real estate listings, and the product got huge. And so, talk a little bit about Birdview. So, that was us, Rowan. I'm still on this whole pirate thing right now. Um, the, so, we were down there, Rowan, really, because the residential real estate market was exploding. We had a unique product. It was absolutely unique. Nobody at that time was doing what we were doing. And, you know, 100% bootstrap company. I'm going to tell you two, two quick things. One is, I went up to California one time with, uh, with a one-way ticket, uh, a hotel room, a car, and one suit. That's all I had. Um, and I went out there, and to get back, I had to sell enough to get a plane ticket home. And I lasted 18 days out there driving from Stride. If anybody knows Southern California, San Luis Obispo to the Mexican border, every night I had to get back to Anaheim because that's where my hotel was. And so when you start talking about bootstrapping a company, you're talking about living like that. I went to Boston one time, and I stayed there for three days with $10 in my pocket. I would go and eat office donuts, and I would go to happy hour, and I would grab a cup and pretend like I was a customer, as an empty cup, because I didn't have money to buy a drink, 
and I would eat the happy hour food. And I'd have the one suit, and I had that one suit for three years, and it was a mess. I still have it. Um, anyway, so, but that's, you know, that's what a startup life is like. A startup life, and I have hundreds of stories of like that. Sleeping in SeaTac Airport in Seattle, sleeping in the car. I mean, it's just, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, don't get in it for the money. If you get into being an entrepreneur, don't do it for the money. You, the money will come if you do it right. If you do it right, the money will show up. I can guarantee you that. Okay? But if, if, you're, if you're going in because you want to get rich, you want to be the, you want to be the next Zuckerberg, or you want to be the next... Uh, Sergey, or you want to be the next, uh, you know, Paul Allen, any of those guys. Yeah, it, it, it's not how it works. Those guys didn't get into it for the money. They got into it because they were passionate about something. Uh, we were evang we were evangelists because the internet was growing at that time. We had not only did we have to sell the idea of the internet, we also had to sell the idea of our product because they didn't believe the internet was going to be anything. And it's hard to say that now in front of you, but they really did not believe the internet was going to change the way business is done. We knew it was. We knew it was, um, and we knew we had something good. We're, we had a we, we had a need that we were filling. Our first re first year revenue, after all said and done, we made a half million dollars. Man, that was exciting. We did a victory lap. Now, we were not being paid. Though. We were paying ourselves just enough to pay the bills at our house, our homes. My partner was living in his parents' house in the bedroom. He was he's two years younger than me. Um, I was I was married, had a kid, and had just bought a house. And my wife would be home. My wife was the woman that would go to the grocery store and have to put things back because there wasn't enough on the debit card. But, you know, that's the other thing is if you get married and you do become an entrepreneur, make sure it's somebody that's got your back. Make sure it's somebody that's a partner, a team, because you put your, you put your spouse or your significant other through hell if you're an entrepreneur in the bootstrap stage. Um, and it really was. It was a lot of fun, and I look back on it with, like, and romanticize it sometimes, but if I put myself back in those moments of actually doing it, it was brutal. Now, Tom C's wins a half. Man, that was beautiful. This, this is where it got fun. So we went from a half million dollars. Revenue peaks at seven million. We were cruising. Man, investors came on board. We had a half million dollars. We had a guy wrote us a check for a half million bucks. It's beautiful. We thought we were the kings. We, we were the kings of the industry, right? We rebranded re to Virgin Technologies. Um, we were growing a business while running a company. And I can tell you right now, Growing a, growing a business is way more fun than running a company. Running a company is not, not for me. Um, I like growing businesses. Um, the product was sold in 34 states. I did over a million miles in the air during that time. I was in airplanes all the time. Uh, I'm still in airplanes all the time. I've had four flights in the last three weeks. Um, so you will travel if you're an entrepreneur. You like to travel, you like to be in airplanes, hotels, all that stuff, there you go. Um, the platform was enormous by this point. It was it was an elaborate, multiple racks, huge. It was sixty three thousand customers on it, um, and it was just it was an immense product. And we we were trending up at the time. We, we were on, we were on a roll and uh, staying in the best hotels in the country, five star restaurants, um, best of everything you could possibly have. We would go to dinner, and it wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't weird for us to spend ten grand on a dinner. That's where we were at that point, and everybody in the real estate industry was at that point. And then, boom. That's not a thing about boom. Boom! It blew up. I mean, it did blow up. Uh, the global real estate flat, we were 97% of our revenue was tied to the residential real estate market. 97%. October 2007, that was the beginning of the end for me. Man, it was a terrible day. I walked in and I looked at our network traffic and our network traffic disappeared. We were a six month leading indicator on the real estate market, meaning that in six months, we would look at traffic. Six months later, we would see a spike in home buyer, home selling activity, right? And I looked at our network October 2007, the traffic was gone. There was none. And I called my partner and said, dude, sell, sell. <laughs> we're screwed. Really, I mean, that's it. And so we reduced the workforce. Um, my best friend, who was my business director of business development, played football with Mr. Eddie and I, um, named Stan Milan. I had to fire him. I had to fire my brother. I had to fire a lot of people. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was hell. And I had the stomach for it because I'm an entrepreneur, but I learned more managing a company on the way down than I did managing a company on the way up. On the way up, it's easy. Everybody loves you. You're doing big three laps. Everybody thinks you're the biggest guy in the world. Managing a company on the way down, that's, that, that's, that's when you're tested. Um, I abandoned ship in February 2012. More on that in a second. Um, 
we sold the company for $1.5 million. Take half pages. Twenty million is a lot less than one point five, isn't it? Significantly less. We had an offer in two thousand six for twenty million right before the crash. Ouch! That one still stings. I've had a lot of bad things happen in a big media business, and usually it's like, whatever, move on. This is one that still stings. <laughs> we had twenty million, and you know, you said, the funny part of it is nobody on the board of directors, none of the investors, none of the people in the company voted to sell. When the vote came aboard, they said, you guys are cruising, man. You're at seven million now, you'll be at 14 million in three years. We're gonna sell that sucker for 50 million. <laughs> Oops. So we, we dumped it, basically, for 1.5 million. We didn't get rich on that, because we had investors. We had to split all that money up. We had enough, I mean, we had a little bit of money in our pocket, but not exciting money, not I'm done money. So, what happens? All right, so undercover boss happens. So in 2010, we purchased a company called Leverage Marketing. Leverage Marketing, we bought this company in 2010. Um, I had nothing to do with it. I wanted to buy a software company. The other owners wanted to buy a marketing company. I lost, they bought a marketing company, so I pouted and went home. Um, that's about what happened. And so we used the revenue from Leverage Marketing to prop up the real estate technology firm. We propped it up, basically. And you know we were bleeding this company to support our other company that was bleeding. And so I really didn't even know these guys. I had nothing to do with them. They were down in Austin, Texas. And I, don't, I, I didn't have one meeting with them, never talked to them. They didn't know who I was, right? So in February 2012, we get the idea that we're gonna sell, we're gonna sell Burger And I said, you know what, I gotta get out of here. Um, I had to get out because I didn't want to sign a non-compete in the sale of the company, uh, which meant that if we sold it to another company in that industry, I couldn't have worked in that industry for a while. So I transferred my employment down here. And the cover story was is that I was just a sales rep at Birdview who needed a job now that we were selling. The reason I did this is twofold. One is I didn't want to be the owner of the company because if you go in as owner, you get a whole level of expectations differently than if you're just an employee. And two, I wasn't committed yet. I didn't know if I, I just needed something to do. And truth be told, I needed some money because we lost you know, hard cash, probably lost about three million. And so I needed a job. And it was tough, some, some pretty tough times. Um, so I needed to figure out, so I just had to go down there and take stock of what we had. So I went on as a sales rep. And they didn't know who I was, and so I had to go to sales meetings. And I, you know what, I went old school. I liked cold calling, I went back to my roots of selling. And I started actually selling. And I wound up becoming, in five months, becoming the top sales guy in the company. I was all proud of myself. And I hated the sales manager. I hated him. And I was his boss. I owned the company, but he didn't know. And every Friday, he would make me go in a meeting. He was using old school sales tactic. New school sales tactic is all about helping people buy. You don't sell anymore. You can't sell. People don't get sold to. They want to buy something. You help them buy it, right? And you, and you show them why it's a good thing to buy. You don't. You know, oh, you do this, you do this, you just don't force, you can't force people to buy it. But he was one of these old school sales guys, and I was, I just couldn't stand it. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's a little, little side, side note there. But anyway, so I figured out when I was down there, we had a good company. It was a good core group of company people, but it was just messed up. We had a leadership problem, and the product sucked. The way they were selling it was terrible. And so I, I watched it for a while. And so, on June, when the ink was dry on the sale of the company, <laughs> I, I, I went to a sales meeting and I said, and he started talking and doing the same stupid stuff he'd always been doing. I said, just shut up. <laughs> just stop. And he goes, what? What are you talking about? I said, I got to tell you the truth. I'm actually one of the owners of the company. And he was pissed. He didn't know what to do. He called my partner, Bedros. Bedro said, yeah, he's one of the owners, just listen to him now. <laughs> and so, and so um, I, I still wasn't committed to it, but I saw that we had this group of people down there that I really liked. And we had, well, the problem was we had uh, too many C players around my A players, right? And you can't build a company with C players. And so what I wound up doing is I, I, I suggested a management buyout of the company, meaning that we had, we had a holding company that owned these companies. And I suggest we buy it back from the shareholders. So we bought the company back in, uh, in, in I took over January 1st, 2013. And let's see what I got here. All right, so company number four. Took over CEO, shrunk the company from 25 employees down to five employees. Um, and in the meantime, while I was doing that, I was also dumping customers. 
because there's companies that just didn't fit our model. They're paying us, but it just didn't fit with what we wanted to build, who we wanted to be as a company. Um, and so I almost crashed with them. And the partners were not happy with me. And I told them, I'm right, I'm right. I'm doing what I'm doing is right. What I'm doing is right. Just listen to me, please listen to me. And this is my first time in the big chair. Bedros was the CEO of the last company. I was the vice president of sales. This time I became the CEO and they were just second guessing every decision I made, but I fended them off. And what wound up happening is about May, I, I thought for sure I was gonna have to go back and eat pro and tell them, hey, yeah, I screwed up. Sorry, we lost all our money again. Um, but in June 2014, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, everything that I've been doing worked. It all worked. And we wound up picking up the largest customer in the history of our company. And we picked up another one after that, and another one after that. And all the things that we had put in place worked out for us. And I, it was it was pretty amazing. It was nothing short of amazing, because I thought for sure at that moment, we were in May, I thought I was gonna have to make that call, and that would have meant a fire sale, and try to sell it to recoup some of our money back. Um, and it didn't happen. And um, the shareholders loved it, so that's a good thing. Um, all right, so that's, that's you know, there's just four companies really in there. Um, and the only real job that I had during this whole time was as a high school teacher. But even while I was a high school teacher, I was still looking to be an entrepreneur. And the real the reality is I'm an entrepreneur. I'll never play first base for the Cubs. I'll never be the dictator of a small Central American country. I'll never walk on Mars. Uh, a lot of things I'll never do. One thing I, I, I am and will always be is an entrepreneur. And, and, you know, that's something I'm proud of, something I enjoy doing. I work really, really hard for a certain pot of time, so I live 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 away most people aren't willing to live, so I can live like I live, uh, like most people don't get to. Yeah, the only way to say, say that without sounding a little cocky, but it's true. Um, I was 23. Don't let anybody tell you that you're too young to start a business. Don't listen to it. It doesn't matter. If you don't need to have experience, it's not that hard to start one. It's hard to execute. Hard to build, sell your product, hard to do a lot of things. Start the business are hard, some paperwork that you fill out. Don't spend a year looking at your logo, you know, or figuring out what the perfect font on your business card is. Get started. Opportunity is often disguised as hard work. And, you know, a lot of people walk over opportunity. It's, it's hard. And hard work, you know, is, say the entrepreneurship, if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with going in and getting a job in a company and doing that. I don't want to sound like just, that, that, that's a bad thing. Some of the richest guys I know are guys that work for companies. <laughs> you know, they're not entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of rich entrepreneurs. Too. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry too much uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you're smart to figure it out. You know, don't don't the unknowns. Don't be afraid of the unknowns. Uh, don't be afraid to take risks and try something nobody else has tried. You know, I was just out at Google. Um, like I said, and they started this thing called Google Loon. Google Loon is uh, they float a balloon sixty thousand feet in the air. And they beam a Wi-Fi signal down to Earth, and they pull a 40 megabit signal, like almost about the same speed as LTE. And when they went to go make these balloons, they didn't hire balloon makers. They hired seamstresses, all these people that had never made a balloon before. Because they knew that the balloon people, they knew one way of making balloons and everything else didn't work. So they went and they hired all these things. When they first started, they tried it with trash bags, <laughs> you know? And they tried all these different ways. And Google's the kind of company that that's how they do things, man. Google just is so innovative. They give a very small budget, and they say, go try to figure this out, right? And so uh, don't be afraid to try something nobody else has ever tried before. Uh, pick good partners, bad partners will kill you. Um, and I know I've had a few, and it's, it's a nightmare. Um, you can't just make money, you gotta manage money too. I learned that the hard way, and um, I have a fantastic CFO now. The CFO actually runs my personal finances too. He gives me an allowance because he does not like goof. So <laughs> I like to spend money. It's fun. So I got a guy that makes sure I don't spend it all. Um, but I say that's my book. That, that's my allowance. Okay, I'm spending it. Um, there's no problems a company has that can't be solved by more revenue. <laughs> more revenue solves everything. I haven't had a business yet that had any problem I had. I couldn't. Hey, I got more money. Oh, I can fix that. No money. Oh, that's real hard. Uh, you got a real great event. Um, don't worry about decisions you make. Go left, go right. It doesn't matter. Keep moving forward. That's it. You make a decision. You go right. Take a, you go left. Don't just stop in the middle. Okay? If you stop in the middle, you're you're gonna get run over. There's no doubt in my mind that no matter what decision it is, it's a decision. And fail fast forward. Fail fast forward. I got that. Uh, I got that sign on my wall in my office down in Austin, Texas. It says, "Fail fast forward." <coughs> 
And, you know, once you make a decision, you know, you determine the decision's bad, that's fine. Learn from it, don't get stuck in it, move on. Wasted a million dollars one year. 2008, you wasted a million dollars on a complete software rebuild. Try to do it in India, right? I'll never do it again, is what that thing's for. And so it was a million dollars we sent over there. We got back the same crappy code in a different language with all the same bugs written into it. We did a horrible job managing it. We did a horrible job specking it out, but we stayed in it for six, eight months too long, and it cost us a million bucks. So you learn to move on. Again, make mistakes, but move on from them. Hire people that complement your skills. Doers, bridgers, and visionaries. Doers, got to have them. Bridgers are the people that talk to the visionaries and translate. Visionaries, you don't need as many of those, but you need them. Right, um, and there's doers, bridges, and visionaries in any company. Doers are worth their weight in gold. My employees down in Austin, Texas, get paid a lot of money. My oldest employee is 29 years old. I have employees that make well over six figures at that young of age because they're doers and they're brilliant and they're awesome. And I wouldn't do it without them. And I'm really good at hiring very smart people. You cannot build an A-plus company with C-minus employees. Get rid of the C's as quick as you can. Redeploy them into the workforce, okay? If you have somebody that's working for you, as you become entrepreneurs, as you get somebody that's working for you, redeploy them into the workforce the minute you find out they're a C player. It's not, you know, you're not a government organization, you, you know, you, you have to get rid of people if they're no good. But on the other side, if they're good, reward them. And it goes back to pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. Don't be greedy, pay your people. Unless you're a funded company, work from revenue backwards. Funded, the game changes once you're funded. You know, so if you got a great idea for an app, or you know, all of a sudden it blows up, you know, and all that stuff, and you get funding, it's different. Um, even if you are a funded company, priority number one, generate revenue or else your company dies. Know when to get out. Startup growth, maturity, decline. Know when to get out. I could have used that lesson when we got offered 20 million bucks. Know when to get out. We were hitting the decline, and I didn't know it, but the decline was precipitated by something we didn't control. That was the thing that killed us. We had no control over the global real estate collapse. But that's that's the life cycle of a business right there. Every business is gonna go through that. And there's one in there now, modern companies, which is reinvention, where you reinvent the company and totally change it, which is what I did to leverage. Leverage was reinvented. The only thing same about leverage now from what it was when we bought it is the name, and that's it. Everything else is completely different. Um, be okay with starting to control for, in fact, prepare for it. I was 43 when my company died. Right, um, 46 now, it's 43 when that company died. I was ready to start over. Guess what, I'm ready to start over again. Bring it, if it wants to blow up on me, I'll do another business, and I'll do another business, and I'll do another business, whatever. Until they uh, drag me off the field, I'm gonna keep starting businesses. I'll never retire, I have no interest in retire. Why would you retire with love what you do, right? Um, don't let perfect get in the way of good enough. Uh, just keep moving and improving. Perfect gets in the way. People get in the way of perfect. My employees will drive me nuts when they wanna get something perfect instead of launching it. Launch it, figure out what's broken, come back and fix it. It's the Microsoft model. That's how they figure out all their bugs. They launch software, everyone reports the bugs, they fix it. And that's how, they, that's, how, that's, how that's their model. They've been doing it for years. Be a pirate. That's it, man. Be a pirate. If you want to be an entrepreneur, be a pirate. That's it. Thanks, guys. So what do you do to weed out C employees and figure out who's an A employee? What do you do? Personally, well, it's pretty simple when you're a B2B company and your um, your job is to deliver a product. So for us, we're a digital search agency. We manage about $20 million a year in search money for big companies all over the country. Um, and so we're on a deadline, meaning that they're looking for return on investment, they're looking at whatever the business goal was that we agreed to do, right? So you put people in charge of certain pieces, whether it be paid search, organic search, content writing, design development, whatever it is, someone's gonna do a piece. You know pretty quickly, you know who identifies them very quickly? The other employees. And the other employees will let you know very quickly. Um, my company's a little bit different than the company you may think of. We don't have office hours. We don't have uh, sick time, paid time off. We don't have uh, dress code, you know. Uh, none of that, we have one rule at our company. Get the job done, you're fired. And they know it and they love it.
because they go to get their dry cleaning during the day. There's no, you know, it's not like they got to be there at any certain time. But I think that's the, the, the economy. Like I said, is most of my employees are younger. Um, 29 is the old, the old man at my company is 29 years old. And what I found is people in your generation, your age, kind of want that kind of a life, right? But it comes with a lot of responsibility. I mean, and you will get fired pretty quickly if you don't produce. And being able to produce is very transparent. I mean, you know, I can look at it in an hour. And to our credit, we haven't in the last three years been have let it go. When I took over, it was a bloodbath. Everyone was getting fired. Um, I don't know what we do around here without you, but tomorrow we'll find out. That's how I let it go. <laughs> they identify themselves really quick, though. I was just um, going back to the construction company. Nah, oh man, construction. Now I don't want to do construction, I'm just wondering. Like, how did y'all, what did y'all get, like, the startup money or, like, the we materials? We didn't. We didn't. We just, you know, we bought a truck that probably cost us about $1,000. Um, things won't beat up for it. It was terrible. And then we grew through revenue. When we got paid, we tried to get our job money in advance. Um, we were charged at the time $100 a bean. Train companies were charged $200 a bean. We would set 25, 30, 40 beams a day. The crane company was set 10 or 15 beams a day. So for us, it was, as soon as we got that money, the problem we had though is we were 23, 24 years old, we were knuckleheads. We would actually go, we go back to the tavern, call them taverns, I would go to the, oh, we go to the bar, and we put the money in the bar, and we'd split it three ways, and we'd walk out with a big stack of cash in the pocket. That was our money management back then. Knuckleheads is what we were, but yeah, that was it. We, did, we took a little slice of it, and then what happened when we got a little bigger, uh, Phil from the guy's mom, who's an accountant, she took the fun, she started taking the money over. Um, and then we were able to invest in tools and equipment and everything else. So, yeah, you grow through revenue when you got no money. Try to get someone to pay you to do what, you, what you're doing. Um, you mentioned that you hide you, people you work with are doers, readers, visionaries. So my question for you is what qualities do you look for in new hires? And how do you encourage employee development in your company? Good question. I look for students. Students who look for, you know, they, they, don't, they run into a problem and they don't go, oh, can't figure it out. They run into a problem and they're looking for a better way of doing something they're, 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 and they're thinking. I, I put it this way, I wouldn't be hired at leverage. I wouldn't, I, I would not make it through the hiring process at leverage because I'm a salesman and we're not hiring salespeople. Um, that's it, you know, that's what I do, I sell. But I look for people that have two sites to my company. One is the math side. Um, which is the paid search analyst. They're looking at data. They're basically, the last guy I hired in paid search has a, has a master's in econ from Baylor. And he's an econ guy. We're about a mile and a half from the University of Texas. So we're a company, so we let the kids out of there. But on the other side is all journalists, writers, content people. Um, so right now, the people that are in demand in, in, in my world are people that can write. If you can write creatively and you're a writer, I can use you all day long. Um, if you're really, really good at math, but not just like a, but, but not just a, like a, someone who's great at math only, they, they gotta be a little creative with that. It's, it's, there's, there's an element of creativity because you are posting that. It's, Google AdWords is a big auction, so I'll leave it at that. But it's uh, econ guys and uh, writers right now. That's on the and my next question for you is, what was your biggest interpersonal challenge growing as an entrepreneur? And how did you overcome it? I care too much. I, say, I, I get this in my job interview. I say, oh, what's your biggest fault? I care too much and I work too hard. <laughs> um, interpersonal challenge, you know, doing all of it and having a balance in life. You know, um, a, a balance of life, meaning that you, you, you spend time with your family, you, you're at the soccer games, and you're at the graduation, you're at the awards events, or you show up to the, the shows, you know, and you, and you spend time with your wife and your kids. And you're actually a dad, you know, instead of just this guy who works all the time. Um, and I work really, really hard to have a balance in life because I work out of my office. I don't work, I've never worked in an office. Um, I live in Northern Virginia, my office, my first company is in Chicago. This company is in Austin, Texas. I own another company I didn't talk about, but it's in Boston. Um, it's, it's, there's no employees and it just makes money. Um, but the, um, yeah, that's it. And that's the biggest interpersonal challenge is, is, is to have a balance when you're doing all this so that you're not one of these guys that's on the road, you know, a lot. Now, early in our career, when my kids were lit, like little babies, I was on the road all the time, but they were too little to know I was gone. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, so I know you said to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to find a need and fulfill it. So since you've been from like four different businesses, you've said, did you like do research to find no, what you were doing, or was it just personal? No, no, we were. I was never a research guy. I mean, I I respected research after the fact. I mean, those guys are those guys that do research in business teach them. They're brilliant. They're awesome. You need them. You need them. But you need them after the fact. Going into stuff, I always just jumped in. You know, and I think that's kind of the risk taker mentality that I have, which is, you know, I was like, I see a cliff, I want to jump off it, hope I land on something soft. Um, non entrepreneurs are going to jump off that cliff, and they're going to they're going to check first to make sure you're soft down there. I mean, I'm going, woo, you know, here we go. And so now I didn't, we didn't do a lot of research going into any of the businesses. And, you know, it, it all came down to I knew I could sell the product. I knew there was a need, and I found a group of people who wanted to buy it. And I knew there'd be more of those people that wanted to buy it. So yeah, not, not a lot of spent time spent reason. Not, not that it's a bad thing, but it just didn't work for us. So you had mentioned early on, or just before the end of your presentation, that if this business failed, you would start another business. And would that be like in a different Field, like first you start construction and then computers and then finance. No, no idea. There's no idea. There's no or idea. you would just pull something out of the hat and then try this. It would be based, it. you know, just like you said with the flyer and a hot dog stand, right? I put a flyer and a hot dog stand, next thing I'm known a real, real estate company. Oh, I'm a real estate company. Next thing you know, I meet my partner and I sell it. So something always happens. That's the that's the, the motto I had learned is something's gonna happen. We don't know what, we don't know when, we can't control everything. So something's gonna happen. And I kind of like, I, you know, I kind of trusted this, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm not afraid of hard work, so, you know, like I said, opportunity will present itself, it'll present itself as hard work, though. I mean, when we were getting leverage, I worked 15 hours a day for three years straight, killed, almost killed myself. I mean, it was brutal. It was, I would say leverage was my hardest because I was had a quick turnaround on a company where I had to turn it around from death to thriving. And I, I'd say that that was the one that took the biggest toll on me. Birdie, was, I was young, it was just fun. So I don't no, I have no idea what would be next. So whatever is next, you would just jump in it without any yeah, research or anything. You just jump in it. I would have there would be there would be sales involved. There would already be there, there would be some opportunity to sell something that we were good at delivering. <coughs> that would be the that would really be it. We'd be it'd be an opportunity. It would be opportunity based, which it always is. Well you know, it has been the last four times. Um, with your college degree, where would you be if you didn't have your college degree? Would you have went down the same path? I'd be or? a cop in Chicago or a fireman. Okay. I'd be a cop or a fireman in Chicago. Yeah, no doubt about it. My buddies that uh, went to high school with, uh, I'll never forget it, and they showed up at my house at my sophomore year in college, it was summer, and they all showed up and they said, let's go. I was like, where are we going? We go, we're going to take the cop test, we're going to take the fireman test. And I kept my back upstairs, I never forget it was, uh, it was old beat up suburban he had it, right? Well, I let me go with my stuff because they're great Chicago, right? You go take the cop test, take the fireman test. And uh, I went up back upstairs and I, something happened. I don't know what it was, but I said, you know what? I don't want to be a cop. <laughs> I'm going to keep going back to school. I'm going to get a degree. And I'll tell you one thing that kept me getting my degree was working that job set of steel in the crane in the summertime was the fact that, you know, I didn't want to do that. And I, and I knew it. I knew I had to get a degree. And I tell you right now, I won't look at anybody at my company without it. It's, it's a filter, and I know a lot of business owners, a lot of business owners that are friends of mine, that are CEOs, that are presidents of companies. I can guarantee that the easiest way for us to get rid of is to have them. And for us, it's efficiency. There's a whole stack of people that want a job with us. Guess which one's going to wipe off our desk right away? No degree? You may be great, you may be awesome, right? You may be, you may be the greatest guy in the world. Now, as far as being an entrepreneur, can you start a business without a degree? Sure. Sure. But, yeah, I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, <coughs> you need a little time, and it's a great place. You learn a lot. I, I learned a lot about business when I was here, that's for sure. So, yeah, I would definitely get plus you. Plus, you proved you started something and finished it. I got a question real quick. So, raise your hand. How many people in here think they have what it takes to be an entrepreneur? Get it up there. Cool. Cool. Yeah. 
Come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> we good? Jeff promised me a steak tonight, so. <laughs> All right, guys.